Greetings today in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Truly, this is a time for rejoicing, for giving God the glory, giving God the honor, giving God the praise. To all those who are celebrating the birth of our Savior, I'm saying continue to celebrate. This is not just a one time or one day thing. This is for an entire lifetime, not just even a year. I'm saying as Christians, we celebrate the fact that Jesus came to us every single day of the year because we understand or we, we, we seek to appreciate what this thing really means. And so we thank God and I thank God that you chose to join us today. Truly, this program is the voice of hope. And I'm saying in the midst of all that life brings our way, we can rest in God. We can have our hope in God. It is only in Him that we live and we move and we have our being. So my encouragement to you today is to really just place your hope in God. I'm saying to somebody, wherever, whatever you try, it will never be as effective. It will never be as peaceful. It will never be as calming as what you can achieve by placing your trust in Jesus Christ. He said it in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3. He says that we, he will keep us in perfect peace. Those whose minds are stayed on him because they trust in him. So even as we celebrate, I'm saying to you, let us celebrate the fact that there is someone that came to redeem us who we can trust with just about every single thing that concerns us. This program, of course, as the voice of hope, it is based on Psalm chapter 42, verse 11, for those who are new to the program, where we understand that David said, listen, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? He says, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance, and my God. So I'm encouraging you today. You trust God. I dare you to trust God. I dare you the things that you want to take back for yourself. You trust God and see what God will use it to do in the midst of all that he allows you to face. Shall we pray today? Almighty and eternal God, it is only to you that we give all honor, we give all glory, we give all praise. We thank you today, God, for the gift that is your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we come to you today, thanking you, God, for life. Thanking you, God, for keeping us. We understand that we can't take any of this for granted. And so, God, we count it a privilege, not just to be alive, but to be alive and to know you, to be able to call upon you. You said, call unto me and I will answer thee. Father, we can stand on your word. We can stand on your promises, God. And I give you all the glory. Lord, we just say thank you as we commit this time into your hands. I thank you for everyone tuned in under the sound of my voice. And I thank you, God, that you have a plan for each and every one of these lives. And God, I thank you that no good thing will you withhold from us, even as we walk uprightly before you. So God, let only your name be glorified and let only your will be done as we commit this time into your hands, as we continue to declare your blessings and your keeping and your hands upon the Tobago inspirational network. We say we thank you, God, because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And we commit this time, we commit every life into your hands. We say, Lord, you receive all the glory, receive all the honor, receive all the praise. As we say, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, today, as we continue to rejoice in this Christmas season, you know, I asked the question recently, what does it really mean to you? How does this whole celebration, is it just, you know, on a, on a time like this, in a season like this, that we just sit and, we, you know, we, 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 we celebrate in different ways. Some people pay attention to having your families around. Some people just, you know, focus on different aspects of it. But I'm challenging and I'm encouraging us today. I'm building to us being so much more mindful 
especially in this day and age where so many different alternatives are presented. What does the birth of Christ mean to you? And I'm asking it then in, in asking the question further, could it then be the reason why on some levels we seem to have lost the reverence for what the coming of Jesus Christ really means? I, I stand amazed at times when maybe I'm listening to the radio, I'm listening to the TV, and there's some kind of encouragement going on as to Jesus Christ coming and the fact that we now have a hope. And then somebody takes the time to call in and start to argue about what day Jesus Christ was born. And you know, a lot of times we have to wonder then, what really is the motivation behind those that seek to discredit and the thing that is, the Bible tells us that, you know, in the last days, people would think that they're doing God a favor, I'm paraphrasing, by trying to discredit the way and the things that we acknowledge and the things that we celebrate in terms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I'm asking us the question today, what does it really mean to you? What does the birth of Christ really signal to the world that we exist in? And so I'm inviting you today to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. And it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of reconciliation to you. We know that we can't do it through our own will. And we thank you today, God, even as your word says, that no man can come unless the Spirit of God draws them. I pray, God, that you would continue by your Spirit to draw us, that we will be reconciled, We'll be closer knit. We'll be, ha we'll be having a more intimate fellowship with you, God. That through it all, God, we will receive the promises that you have made to us even before we came into this world. And so we say, have your way with us and lead us in the way that you would have us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I was saying before, we did an episode previously where we spoke about why he came and we looked at all the different things that, you know, Jesus' life represented. Where he came, we looked at him being born, we looked at him going in, in Matthew chapter 4 with the fast and, and, and being tempted of the devil. And then he started his public ministry and we looked at Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes and the different things that Jesus took the time when he was here to teach us about knowing and understanding that, you know, even as the song says, he came from heaven to earth to show us the way, to teach us how to live, that we in turn can be truly the reflection. We know that we are made in his image, but we can truly be a reflection of God in this world. He did it with the Israelites where he gave them laws so that they can be a reflection of him amongst the heathen, amongst the people who serve other gods. And it is so when Jesus came and he was dealing, he dealt with the, you know, the scribes, the Pharisees, the people that had the law that as it were perverted it. And here comes Jesus on earth in the timing that he did, as the Bible tells us, in the fullness of time to show us, to teach us, to reconcile us 
as God had ordained. So some of the things he taught us, he taught us about being salt and light. He taught us about being righteous and how it related to the law, how he came to fulfill the law. He taught us how to relate to each other, where he spoke about being angry is like being, is like being in danger of judgment. He also taught us about being reconciled to each other. If we have a, a, an issue with a brother, before we come and offer him a gift, he told us, listen, go and be reconciled to your brother. So this issue of reconciliation is not just about being reconciled to God, but because we are representing God on earth, we should be looking to be reconciled to those that may, we may have an issue with, we may have some form of enmity with. He spoke as well about you know, being able to sacrifice your own desires for the greater good. He spoke about things like letting your words stand as yea and nay, rather than you know, getting into trouble by saying much more than you should. He spoke about loving your enemies. These things would help us to distinguish ourselves as children of God in a world that so needs to see it. He says we shall know each other, we shall know Christians by the love that we have. Not just for each other. He says that's easy. If you love those that love you, that's easy. But what about those that have the, the worst to say about you? That outrightly show that they despise you? Are you able to show that love? These are some of the things that Jesus came to teach us. He told us no man can serve two masters. He told us don't worry about what we are going to eat, what we are going to drink. He already knows our needs. And one of the greatest things he taught us is how to pray. How we are to converse, as it were, with our God. Where we don't have to say all these great prayers for men to see and to seek the praise of men. Because he says, even as we commune with our Father in the spirit, in the secret place, that he himself will reward us openly. So we don't have to worry, we don't have to fret. And as Jesus came to teach us, I'm saying to us, as we choose to apply what he taught, we are able to make a difference in this world. And so even as we go through today and we ask the question, you know, what is it all about? I want to take the opportunity today to emphasize the word reconciliation. You know, in, in our society, it is very easy. Maybe you have an issue with somebody and it's easy to, you take this side and you take that side and you all go on. But I'm suggesting to somebody, somebody who is going through it, somebody who has suffered, you know, a, 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 a breakdown in their family, where both sides are hurting and nobody wants to yield their pain, nobody wants to yield their, their, their right, as it were. And so they prefer to go apart. And in so many chat rooms and, you know, WhatsApp and whatever, whatever, you would always find somebody that would tell you, you're right for doing so. But can I suggest to you, can I suggest to your friends, can I suggest to your advisors that God had a greater plan? And I'm, I'm not saying that it is easy. But I'm saying that God gives the grace. It is the same ministry of reconciliation that Jesus came to accomplish. He came to reconcile us to God. And we know and understand that we need it. And in the midst of it, we, we know and we remind ourselves and we rejoice in the fact that 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 reminds us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I'm saying, if God is long-suffering to usward, why is it so hard for us to be long-suffering to others? Knowing and understanding that long-suffering is one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit that we are all called to strive for. 
So I'm suggesting to us, just as God is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that we should perish, but wanting to see us come to that place of repentance. And we know the definition of repentance tells us about changing your mindset, turning and going in another direction. But can I just expand on that a little bit? In the sentence, in, in, in the, the context of this verse, he's long suffering, not willing that we should perish, but that we should come to repentance. We should return to him in acknowledging that what we have done or how we have lived or the choices that we have made have caused us to be separated from him. And so repentance then means returning to him coming into agreement with him that what he has said is true, that his way is right, that he wants the best for us. I always say he wants better for you than you can ever want for yourself. And once you come into agreement with him in that regard, it helps you to yield your own desires. It helps you to yield your own understanding of things, which so many times are wrought in error and are wrought in fleshly desires even though the book of Galatians reminds us about yielding to the flesh and the consequences that it can have. I'm saying we don't even have to look very far in our own society. We see the effects of persons yielding to their fleshly desires rather than allowing the things that God has placed within us as spiritual beings to come to the fore, that God will be glorified. And as such, we pay the price. And I'm saying to us today, you know, the fact that God knew you all along, the fact that God knows everything about you, the fact that despite all that God knows about you, he loves you all the same should be enough for you to say, God, I surrender. But still, there are so many of us that choose to try to figure it out for themselves. And I'm saying, if I ask us the question today, and I do a poll, maybe there's for, for everybody that's listening, and I say, how many of you need to be reconciled to God? I'm not sure that I'll get everybody to raise their hands. I'm not even sure that I can get 50% of persons listening because it is easy in, uh, in the midst of all that we do to think, well, I'm a good person. God loves me, so I don't need to be reconciled. The thing about it is, the Bible tells us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that's beside the point. It shows that his love for us. But does that mean that we're automatically reconciled to God? Does that mean that we're automatically on our way to heaven? Or does that mean that we have something to do in order to make full use of the promises that his, reconcil that his, his work on the cross provided for us? The thing about it is, it is easy to get comfortable. We've seen instances in the Bible where the guy says, listen, I haven't killed anybody, I pay my tithes, I do this, I do that, and you have a checklist. But sometimes, and especially pride, causes us to see ourselves in a greater light than anything else that we can do. So it's like, I'm good. You, you, you might even hear people say, I've never sinned. And you know, I've heard some about some people that have said it, and it's funny, yes. But God's word says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we know that. The Bible also tells us in the book of Isaiah that our righteousness are as filthy rags. And as such, we cannot save ourselves. We have to make a decision that we want to be reconciled to God. A lot of times we think about what happened in the Garden of Eden and you know I was saying it is like a utop it was like a utopia and instead of us making the most 
of the fellowship that God intended for us in the first place, we have turned instead to using the things that God created for us to enjoy. We turn instead to using it to destroy ourselves, to destroy each other. And I'm saying that's not what God intended for us. And it is emphatic of the reason why we need to be reconciled to God so that God's perfect purposes can be accomplished. No one understand that the gifts and calling that God has placed within us are without repentance. Eve and then Adam chose to do otherwise. But even in the midst of that, we look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This was God after he confronted Adam and Eve, after he confronted the serpent, making it known that even in the face of that, he still had a plan to reconcile his people to himself so that his purposes for our creation can be accomplished in the first place. And I'm saying God put things in place. And when we see this verse, we understand that this verse was fulfilled with the coming of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, as the Bible tells us, he came to destroy the works of the enemy. Through what Adam and Eve did, the enemy had, as it were, dominion, had rights on the earth because Adam transferred it, as it were, in choosing to sin against God. And I'm saying to you today, the time has come when you must make a decision. Tomorrow is not promised to any one of us. Do you need to be reconciled to God? This is not the time to lean onto your own understanding. This is the time to trust in the Lord with all your heart, to not lean onto your own understanding, but in all your ways to acknowledge him, knowing that he is willing and able to direct your path. And I'm taking it even further. And I'm saying, even as you are reconciled to God, I'm encouraging you to make sure and reconcile, be reconciled to your brothers, be reconciled to your brethren, be reconciled to that person that is hard for you to love, knowing and understanding that this is what God has called us to. It is still not God's will that any of us should perish but that all should come to repentance. And as I close, I close with that verse again in verse 20 and verse 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's show forth his righteousness. Let's go forth knowing that God is willing and able to receive us even as we return unto God. So I'm saying to you today, as you go forth beyond this time and beyond this season, make sure that your attitude is one to know that you've been redeemed by God, that you've been reconciled to God, that you will extend the gift of reconciliation to those that have hurt you, to those that you know don't wish you well. But I'm saying to you, you will be amazed at what God can use your heart of reconciliation to do to draw people to himself. He is still not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Because he has said it, 
even as you are willing to walk in it, know and understand that God will get the glory out of your life. God will be pleased when it is your desire to see people reconcile to God, when it is your desire to reconcile and to heal the relationships that have broken down, whether in your life, in your family, in your church, on your workplace, wherever they are. I'm challenging somebody today. You be an agent of reconciliation, knowing that God has reconciled you. May God bless you, give you his wisdom, give you his peace, knowing and understanding that he is with you always for his honor and glory. Amen.